So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Namaskar. It's my pleasure to be here this afternoon to chair our panel discussion on access and diversity. Why English language teachers need to embrace both. We're very lucky to have Esther Amani and Michael Joseph with us today, all the way from South Africa. They both worked on the first multilingual degree at the University of Lipopo, and in 2003, they founded a BA in Contemporary English and Multilingual Studies, and it's the only dual medium program at any South African university. So first they'll do their presentation, and then afterwards they'll be taking questions from the floor. So without further ado, I would like to invite Esther and Joseph to do their presentation. <coughs> Dear friends, colleagues, and fellow teachers, it's a very great pleasure for Michael and I to return to India and uh, to what we knew as CIEFL many, many years ago. Um, this year, we celebrate our 21st anniversary in South Africa. So we reached there in 1992. And when we went there, though we are speakers of two or three Indian languages, we had a very monolingual awareness and consciousness and felt that as English language teachers, we needed to focus on only or mainly English language teaching. Before I go any further, I'd like to thank my colleagues at uh, EFLU for inviting us and the British Council, especially in South Africa and Kenya, for supporting our travel and making it possible for us to be here. So, what we'd like to do today is to talk about some of the devastating aspects of education, especially school education in South Africa, uh, both as a result of apartheid, which um, made it impossible for black children to access quality education, and also the effects of English only or English mainly policies in education. It would be no exaggeration to say that South African education is in crisis and systematic evaluations of in and international tests have shown that South Africa comes last in literacy and numeracy when compared to 44 other countries. So it is a real crisis. So this is an overview of our presentation. We're going to talk about some key concepts from a leading uh, critical language specialist in South Africa called Hilary Jenks. We're going to touch on some of the debates around diversity and then give our own position on the difference between access to language and access to knowledge. We often talk about the global or market economy failing to say that that market economy is actually a knowledge economy and how do we ensure access to knowledge. And then we'll give some examples from South Africa to show how bilingual and multilingual education both provides that access to knowledge as well as um, helps students to gain competence in English. I'm now going to hand over to Michael to talk about these concepts. The debate in South Africa, all of South Africa, uh, but not necessarily about South Africa, examples, uh, because it stretches beyond. <laughs> Uh, has been polarized into two emphases. One emphasis is on on access, and by access is meant access to dominant forms of knowledge, uh, dominant forms of discourse, that means academic literacies, and dominant languages, which are the European languages, primarily English. Uh, but in South Africa, there's been uh, Portuguese, German, and other colonial languages as well in other parts of Africa, but in South Africa it is English. So the access 
uh, to dominant discourses is a, an idea that is uh, taken very much from Bourdieu, uh, the notion of cultural capital, which has been voiced in this conference, uh, uh, Basil Bernstein, and those who are arguing for access are really arguing for the right of, of marginalized people, that is those whose languages are not English, those who come from socio-economically uh, lower groups, uh, to have access to these dominant forms of knowledge, discourses and language. So that is the access position. And then on the other side has been those who emphasize diversity, by which is meant uh, local languages, uh, which are, well, there are nine languages in South Africa official and many other dialects, uh, but not only languages, it also includes forms of knowledge, largely comes under the rubric of indigenous knowledge, but those are the canonical forms, a lot of everyday forms of knowledge in, in Africa, and uh, forms of cognition, processes of reasoning, uh, which are there in everyday culture. So the debate has been polarized upon, uh, based upon whether people want to give access or to give diversity. And interestingly, the debate, whichever position that has been taken, both believe they're empowering disadvantaged learners. Both believe they're progressive, but, but their emphases are different. Now, recently, in the last one year, Jenks, who is a critical language awareness scholar has, ma has managed to pull together the different debates under four key concepts and that's going to be our presentation around these four key concepts. One is domination which is a short form for um, the need to expose the power of the dominant forms that is languages like English, dominant forms, academic literacies and knowledges the need to expose how they are constructed. The argument being that if you do not tell students how dominant knowledges are constructed, they will assume that these knowledges are neutral or have inherent qualities about them, and they will assume that the everyday forms of knowledge and language have some inherent inferior qualities about them. But once we show how knowledges get constructed, over time, over history, uh, then we are actually developing the critical awareness of students. So this has been one argument for domination or hegemony, to expose the hegemony. Access, as I said, is the right of students to have access to dominant forms. Diversity, language, cognition and knowledge. Now design, Jenks has brought this in rather late and it means even if you expose the domination of English, even if you give students the right of access to English, even if you acknowledge the diversity of the local languages and knowledges, you still have to design curriculum, pedagogy, material. Otherwise, you're only giving symbolic importance to, uh, to the dominant forms. So, Jiangs very cleverly uses these four key ideas to say, if you exclude any one of them, these are the consequences. This is what's going to happen. So what she is providing is a map to allow people to engage in debates and discussions. But there's a tendency in South Africa, I don't know if it's worldwide, for people in the social sciences to avoid confrontation of their respective paradigms. And there's a tendency that when there's about to be some difference for them to very eclectically embrace the opposite position as a temporary strategy. This framework of Jiang's allows a professional debate to happen, and that is a very welcome sign. So I'll move on then to uh, five ideas that we are going to touch upon as our theoretical framework, but a lot of our presentation is going to be to show you what we have actually done in South Africa. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on the theoretical framework. I'm going to rush through this. The first one is diversity by default and the majority of students in, in South Africa who are largely black students from rural backgrounds uh, use their mother tongue in spite of the official policy being English. So they use diversity 
in the classroom, but it's by default. They don't feel proud of their languages, but they use it nevertheless. Uh, we're going to talk about what is the consequence of this kind of diversity by default. The celebration of diversity is the position which has been largely identified by critical ethnographers, those who believe in an ecological view, um, and those who believe in language rights come under uh, position two. They do what is called celebrate diversity. And uh, on the other hand, they don't emphasize access to the dominant forms. We find the first two positions on diversity problematic. We'll go into that. The third position is the position that we have adopted and we are going to develop, and that, that is diversity of languages, cognition, and knowledges of the students as a route to epistemic access uh, by design. Uh, I won't say anything about it because our presentation is on that. The fourth one is access. Those who believe that we must give access to English, academic literacies, dominant knowledges, but without exposing them to how these dominant forms got constructed historically, um, this is the dominant paradigm, at least in South Africa, and it's a civilizationist model. Students, leave behind your languages, leave behind your cognition the moment you come to schools or university and get access to English, academic literacy, etc. So this is the status quo, the dominant paradigm, and all the other positions, one, two, three, and five, are actually opposing this status quo, this fourth position. Uh, since you all know this position, there's no need for me to elaborate that. Five is the critical language awareness position, that is, we must give students access to the dominant forms. Uh, but the moment we give access to the dominant forms, we reinforce the hegemony of these dominant forms or English. So progressive educationists feel a sense of embarrassment and guilt that if you give access you get students out of the ghetto, but then you, you entrench the domination of English. So they tend to get paralyzed with guilt because of this position. So we worked with Jenks about how English teachers can get out of guilt, and they came out with what was called the access paradox. That is, you have to give access to the dominant forms, but you do, uh, and you do entrench the power of these dominant forms, and that's a reality or that's a paradox we've got to live with. So that was the position that the CLA people came out with. CLA stands for Critical Language Awareness. Uh, the CLA position with which we largely agree um, is that it's, you must give access to the dominant forms, you must give best, the best possible access to English to marginalized students. You must uphold the right to access of English, even if you know that English is hegemony. This is difficult for many people to accept. Uh, a, a constitutional court judge by the name of Alby Sachs about 10 years ago famously said, all rights, all language rights are rights against English. And CLA and ourselves said, yes, that's true, but you still have to give, you still have to guarantee access to English as a right. I mean, you've got to tell students you have a right to English. You can't assume because English is hegemony, therefore they're going to get it. They have been historically deprived of dominant forms, so the way to redress that historical uh, neglect has, has been you have to grant them the right to these forms, and that is quite important. Uh, you have to uh, recognize diversity and then you have to design for diversity. Now the last point about designing for diversity, we found our friends, critical language awareness, are not doing that. They're largely in historically white universities. They continue with English. They continue to expose the power of English. Philipson and, and those people who talk about the hegemony of English, uh, they recognize diversity but only as a theory. So there are problems we have with that fifth position, uh, which we're going to address. Now we want to move towards what happens when you 
do not grant access to English. The majority of students who are in what are called state schools or government schools and who are largely, as I said, uh, black students, that is, whose languages are African languages, um, they have got limited access to English as a subject. Neville Alexander wrote a very famous article. Neville Alexander has been the champion of multilingualism in South Africa. He shared a prison uh, uh, with Nelson Mandela and he tried to persuade Mandela that South Africa should be a multilingual nation rather unsuccessfully. Um, but he wrote this article called English Unassailable but Unattainable. And this article brings out the, the pathos of the students who don't have access to English but still hunger for English. They still want to, have, to go to what are called ex modelsy or private schools. And though they are using their mother tongue, they don't feel proud of their mother tongue. Most of these students uh, when they shift to grade 4, that's English medium, in the state schools tend to drop out, uh, as this picture shows. Um, the nearest that I can think of the agony that the majority of students suffer is the myth of Tantalus in Greek mythology. Some of you would know that Tantalus was a character who was punished. I don't know for what crime, do you know that? Well, something related to food. And his punishment was that he was tied by chains um, and food was placed just outside his reach, which created a great desire for food which he could not satisfy. Now that is the situation with majority of students who um, are deprived of English but crave for it. So we would like to bring the issue of desire as something that we want to tackle. We cannot ignore the desire that people have for a hegemonic form, even if we are critical of that hegemonic form. Diversity without access, this is the ecological argument, it's associated with very big names, Hornberger from uh, the University of Pennsylvania in America, Shirley Bryce Heath, Ian Moll. They celebrate diversity on the grounds that it's time that we push for diversity because the dominant forms have had that day. Let's shift the balance of forces. The problem with the diversity approach, it is associated with language rights, it's associated with identity. The problem is that it can ghettoize students. It can lock them into a particular culture. In South Africa, to say, use the word tribal culture is not politically correct, but people would say that you know, don't tribalize us. <coughs> so there's a danger that if we celebrate diversity, it might be very good for us as researchers, as people who come from the dominant culture, we like to research diversity, but the people, the students who, if you ask them, they are not hooked on diversity. They say, we want to have access. Give us what you have. And what you have is what makes you powerful. You can stand here and talk in English, okay? So that's their demand. So the ghettoizing of, of students is what happens if you go for diversity. One of the extreme forms of diversity has been pushed by Sinfrey McCorney and Penny Cook, who are not just, they reject both access to dominant forms and the diversity on the ground that this is colonial and missionary, they want to reinvent Africa itself, which is a pretty big task. Uh, I don't want to go into a criticism of them, but our friend Professor Zobeda Desai from the University of Western Cape, in a keynote address recently, pointed out uh, certain double standards in people who want to celebrate that extreme form of diversity. The, the double standard comes in this form. You argue for diversity for the students, for the reinventing of Africa, etc., but then you mark your students assessment, assignments, with red ink, you expect them to come up to standard English. How do they do that without any qualms of conscience? So there is a paradox here. It's possible that most of us in this room are caught up in that paradox, that we may advocate diversity, but we're still actually pushing our students to attain standard English. Um, the Jank's critical language awareness position, which I'm going to end with, we have been very much influenced by them, but we have certain differences. 
and the difference is that they do not design for diversity. We heard a presentation yesterday from Nivedidu, right? Sorry, Nivedita, uh, and uh, who has been inspired by Vanamala Vishwana, uh, who come out with extraordinary materials in Canada, Hindi, and English, where students are. Uh, teachers do tasks to raise their metalinguistic awareness. So we are very pleased that there is the de design of diversity happening uh, that we've seen in some of the presentations in this conference. Our difference in that would be that we design for diversity of knowledge, and that is epistemic access, not simply for English language, but the local languages need to be used to get knowledge capital. So that would be our difference. Uh, with the critical la language awareness, we think that they do end up with symbolic awareness and not really giving access to students to their local languages. Um, in, our, in the university where we last work, University of Limpopo, where we developed the bilingual degree, it's the university that every year has the spring lectures where they talk about the African Renaissance, indigenous knowledges, they celebrate diversity, but they are very hostile to the design for diversity. And we are an example of people who design for diversity and experience the full weight of their hostility. Uh, so this is an interesting situation. Why are uh, African black intellectuals opposing um, the actual implementation of the local languages? Uh, and so it's not just the historically white universities, it is a very big political question which I won't have time to go into but simply raise it over here. Uh, they would do a lot of things like name changes and uh, talking about the historical past but the present to enable students to actually get knowledge through their languages, that is not happening. And that's where we have done something unique which we would like to present. Um, Esther is going to I think I'll hand over to her the access and diversity. How do we provide epistemic access through diversity? That means how can the mother tongue be used for knowledge creation and knowledge generation? Not for identity purposes, but for knowledge purposes. Okay. Yeah, we are going to draw from two examples. The first is the Project for Alternative Education in South Africa. This is actually an NGO but located within the University of Cape Town um, in the Western Cape. Now, we have been greatly inspired by the work of um, Indian multilingual specialists like Ramakant Agnihotri. And this morning, I think many of you were at the presentation of uh, Professor Ajit Mohanty. And, but in South Africa, the person that has inspired us is Dr. Neville Alexander. Huh? Um, and he, as oh, Michael yeah. pointed out, has been a great inspiring force in South Africa. And what we're going to show you is a bit of an advocacy video that the Prysa group produced to convince people about the value of multilingual education and what happens when children are educated or given content knowledge in a language they do not know. I think this has been called the burden of incomprehension in the NCRT um, focus paper, position paper on English language teaching. So can we have the first clip please? And you don't want to stay. <laughs> we don't want to stay away. Starting in English is forest, eh? They don't want to stay in forest. Hi, I'm a bit do. If you buy it, buy it. Then, if people came out, why do they come out? Why are they so? Sunni. We speak about learner-centered education in South Africa, for example, and yet we insist on teaching children in a language they don't understand. If it's learner-centered, 
you'd expect that the language of the child is the point of departure. Instead, it's the language, not even of the teacher, because most of the teachers are not even first language speakers of English. It's a foreign language. In black and white, it is written in constitution that all the languages are equal. That, 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 that is written. But practically, it doesn't, it's, it's not been done like that. It's the way that our, our mindset has been set up. That everything that is superior and everything that is pure must be done in English. That is a concept that our parents have. We want to speak English because we want white people to understand us. But I think it should be a, a, a two-way. They should also understand us. If we can speak their English, they must also learn to speak our closer. <laughs> I'm trying to say it was this or put each other in good day. I'm trying to say it's a point of unfunicel, the experiment, Yenzuluaz, gets closer, Kuni Lulu Milesitat, Uninzu Labakundi, when Zukaz in Lassa Africa, Lufunda, Lupale, Vivo, Ulu Milesitat, Uluba Singesi, Ukanya is in French. Tishalagas, Babu. In Constitution, like the case, you make the ice cream, which is out of the ice. It was quite unfair because uh, I, I would like try really hard to understand the question and then when I understood it, I couldn't answer it. It just felt like I was stupid when I, when I knew all the correct things. I just couldn't say it. If the teacher asked me a question in Corsa, I, I would take about five minutes to understand the question and by then would, there would be another question. It would be so hard to write our exams in Corsa. Um, I would probably like leave the country and go to another country where you can write in, your, in the same language. If I had to write my exams in another language um, that I didn't understand, I would probably, I might be able to get um, a few marks, but I wouldn't be able to get enough to pass. I couldn't understand the question, let alone answer it, because um, I'm not very good at causing. If I had to write exams, I wouldn't bother going to school. The textbooks are only in English and Afrikaans which forces a child who's doing COSA to learn, to learn that before he, he, he even understands the content, what is being taught there, he should first understand, try to understand what, what is said, so the communication first, before going to the content of the subject. When they mark papers, they don't consider that this child is a COSA-speaking child. Papers are set on one standard, so it is very unfair and it is disadvantaging our kids really. When it is a biology paper, the biology paper will only have only two languages, that is Afrikaans and English, the course is not Our kids are not passing the, the, the content subject as they will do if the questions were in, in their language. Some hear English only in your class. At home, nobody knows English and there are no TVs. You see, that's the problem. When you're talking them to them in English, it's a foreign thing. The only kids who have mother tongue education from the cradle to the university are first language English speaking children and very many first language Afrikaans speaking children, which means that those who were advantaged before the fall of apartheid are still the advantage after the fall of apartheid. We are asking for no more than what most people in the so called first world have, namely mother tongue education. <laughs> Close to the end, I got a bit bored.
who hadn't even bothered to try because I couldn't understand what the teacher was saying. And it just um, makes me feel better for people who have to do it every day. You don't get more water than Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Anika? Yeah. Anika? It goes up. <laughs> <laughs> it goes up. I felt felt sorry for the people around me because they didn't quite understand what what the teacher was saying and I was the only one who quite understood what she was saying. Today I really envied Leo and admired him for the way that he answered most questions he was asked, in fact all of them, and I really wish that I could speak cause as well as he could. Um, I realized how hard it must have been for him in grade one when he came to an English school trying to learn a totally different language. He never heard any words of it. He couldn't understand anything. And I really think he has done very well to get as far as he has in English. Because of the hegemonic position of English in the world today, uh, because it's the key to social mobility, to upward uh, uh, social mobility in South Africa, people understandably and justifiably want uh, their children to learn English. What most people don't understand is that it doesn't follow, therefore, that they will acquire the best command of English if they are taught from day one through the medium of English. That does happen, of course, but it happens only under very specific conditions. Conditions which don't exist in most African schools, certainly not in most black schools. Okay, I think we can stop the video here. All right, so what you've just seen is uh, Dr. Neville Alexander talking uh, in this film that was made to educate parents, teachers, students, because there's a great need, a tremendous need for people to understand that even though there's this great desire for English, the best way to attain English is not by neglecting the mother tongue and going straight for English from grade one, as Professor Mohanty showed us so poignantly this morning. The next project is the, the BA in Contemporary English and Multilingual Studies. This is the first dual medium degree, undergraduate degree in South Africa that uh, Michael and I began in 2003. Uh, I'll get on to that, yes. Um, it's the first degree in South Africa in which both English and an indigenous black African language called Sipedi are used as media of instruction. We all know that the best resources for teaching and learning, materials, methodologies, etc., are locked up in the English language. And one of the aims of this degree was to transfer those materials and methods of teaching, the innovations, to an African language. So the project was not just developing a degree, but also training our African colleagues in new ways, innovative ways of teaching the mother tongue, teaching knowledge through the mother tongue. We launched it in 2003, and just to give you an idea of where this place is, Limpopo is the northernmost province of uh, the Republic of South Africa, marked in red there. And this gives you some idea of the kind of province that is very rural. Uh, most of the students come from township, uh, farm schools, rural schools with very, very poor access, um, not only to English, but to many of the facilities that we can take for granted in um, towns and urban areas, like toilets, running water, etc. This is the entrance to the University of Limpopo. It's a rural university located within a township, and most of our students come from the kind of schools I've just been talking about. The BA in Contemporary English and Multilingual Studies is made up of two strands. It's a three-year program, and as you can see, the strands on the left are all taught in the medium of English and assessed in English. That is, the teachers speak English, lecture in English, set tasks in English, the materials are in English, 
but the students in discussion freely and unstoppably use their own language and that is perfectly acceptable. On the second, in the second strand, you see the multilingual studies modules and these are all taught and assessed in Sipedi. There was a huge challenge of trying to find scholarly materials in, for, at university level for a Sipedi language and fortunately we received a huge grant from the Ford Foundation to be able to employ translators to translate articles by people like Neville Alexander, Kathleen Hugh, Hornberger and other multilingual specialists into Sipedi. Uh, the degree, as you can see, draws from uh, areas in applied linguistics, sociolinguistics, linguistics as such, and it enables students to gain uh, a rounded knowledge of these areas but with a focus on dual medium education. So we say that the goal of this degree is to, pr is to produce bilingual applied linguists. We want to just give you an idea of the enrollment figures from 2003 when we began to last year, 2012. I hope you can see the figures, but I just like to draw your attention to the fact that in 2003 we had 38 enrollments and last year we had 278. This is no small feat because students themselves resist learning in their home language. They have been so socialized into thinking about English as the language for academic development, for cognition, for higher order thinking, that we have had to counsel give career counselling to these students to convince them that while they do six modules in their own language, they will also be getting excellent access to English in the other six modules. And every year, the, the people who do the recruitment into the program are the graduates and the students who are already registered on this degree because they are the best advocates of what this degree is about. So this degree is seen as something of a model in South Africa and there are two other universities that are now doing this. We did it in English and Sipedi, but they are doing it in English and Zulu and English and Isikosa, which you saw earlier, that language. I'm now going to ask Michael to take over from here and show how our degree is based on the ideas of Jim Cummins. Thank you. You can... There's no need to explain this, it's self-explanatory. I just need to say that the first cycle, that's monolingualism, the simulationist model, that's why most of the elite students, they go into those schools. Um, most of our students come from the second one, the big and small wheel. That means their mother tongue has been developed and then they learn English as a lang uh, second language. Uh, and we want them to retain that mother tongue that they had in schools and to prevent any language loss and move to the, the middle cycle with two equal wheels. Now you all know that the monocycle actually existed but it's now in the museum and we would wish that one day monolingualism is also put in the museum and that the two wheeled bicycle is that is representing equal bilingual or dual medium instruction, that that, is, that becomes the norm. And so the SEMS degree is really based upon the development of both the languages for epistemic access. The last model that Cummins gives, that's the most terrible nightmare, that you give a student's education in two languages uh, and it's both are flat. They don't develop it for epistemic access. And that could very well happen given and in this conference itself that often literacy is not even taught in the mother tongue, low order cognition prevails as a pedagogy in the mother tongue. So we've got to watch out for bilingual education is not the only issue to deal with but the pedagogy, particularly cognitive levels, are learners learning content through higher order reasoning skills. So. Um, to avoid that fourth possibility. Cummins, and again I'm going to be very brief, this is a diagram which is very central to our degree. We also teach students uh, a module. Uh, what is very important is language people 
tend to know the x-axis, that is, co the context embedded, context reduced. Uh, we know that. But they, they know much less the cognitive axis, the y-axis, where cognitively undemanding tasks and cognitively demanding. Now, Cummins brings these two together, and the quadrant B is the quadrant that we need to concentrate on, where uh, context embedded language, whether it is English or whether it's an African language or a local Indian language, we need to use what's called the syntax of conversation, language which is actually very much context embedded, to use it for cognitive purposes, not simply for affective purposes, not simply as a transition to English, but to process knowledge uh, in this quadrant so that students can then maybe write essays, context-reduced essays in quadrant D. So the aim of this model for Cummins is all students enter schools or university from quadrant A and they exit schools or universities from quadrant D. No one will disagree with this. But the debate comes about as to whether the best route from A to D is via C or whether it is via B. Those who argue for going via C are arguing for rote learning, for lower order cognition, for safe talk, where you carry through the motions of learning. Uh, and unfortunately, most of the schools uh, run our quadrant C base. Quadrant C based pedagogy does not take students to quadrant D, does not make them autonomous learners. So Kamen's argument and ours would be take students through quadrant B, cognitively challenging tasks aimed at knowledge acquisition so that they can move to quadrant D both in the local language and in English. A very quick example of the highest order of cognitive challenge that we give our students is not on knowledge dissemination but on knowledge construction. Here you can see a student third year undergraduate, designing puzzles which she's going to take into her community and give these puzzles to a child between the age of four and six to see whether she could elicit private speech to test the ideas of Piaget and Vygotsky on this controversial theme. Do children produce private speech in African communities? Because most of the data on private speech comes from Europe. And it looks as though the European languages are the only ones that are used for cognitive processes, like private speech. Does it mean that the African languages are not used for cognitive purposes? So the students say, no, but we do use private speech. We know it exists. And I say to them, well, prove it. Go and do an experiment. Take your video camera, conduct the experiment, and let's see if you get the data. So this has been a, a very exciting kind of research. They interview students and parents in the mother tongue, that's Sesutu Salaboa or Sapedi. They uh, collect private speech on the video camera. They transcribe it, and then they translate it and they put the transcription into the assignments and they write the assignments in English. And this is a very good example of a bilingual assignment, uh, which is very doable. I don't know the local language, but the students know, and I can manage that. Uh, I need not take you through the SUP and CUP models of Cummins. It has been presented in other presentations in this conference. On the left is the monolingual view that languages don't transfer, cognition don't transfer uh, across languages, whereas Kamen's view is that whether you learn it through one language or another, there's a common underlying proficiency. Here is an example of a student in the third year who has now become a member of our staff. She's the first bilingual teacher, but when she was a student, she learned mind maps in the English class. When she went to the Sepedi class, she transferred that knowledge and produced a mind map for assignment where the main headings are in English. You can see that. Aims, methods, findings are all in English. Can you see that? And the, the, the notes related to the main headings are in Sepedi. That's the mother tongue. This is a bilingual mind map. And it was produced by the student without instruction from the teacher. <coughs> Now, there are a lot of these kinds of things that we can do 
but these are examples of two languages being used for epistemic access, not for identity. We're not saying identity isn't important. We're saying identity should be an outcome of epistemic access. It should follow, not proceed. Well, I think uh, this is something you will elaborate on. Um, since we are mostly talking to teachers at uh, school, we'd just like to briefly say what are the implications of the BASM's degree for schooling. And um, as you might be aware, in South Africa, the medium of instruction is the child's home language only up to grade three. Grade four is traumatic because that's when the children transit to English as a medium of instruction. So we would argue on the basis of our bilingual degree that it is possible to do cognitive work in your mother tongue and that the medium of instruction, um, the mother tongue being used as medium of instruction must go well beyond grade three. This morning, Professor Mohanty talked about five to eight years as being sufficient to lay a strong foundation for cognitive work in the mother tongue. We need to improve the teaching of English as an additional language throughout schooling and that I think is the main task of us as ELT people, but we would argue that it has to be done through dual medium education. And then to use the home languages of learners as an epistemic resource in English lessons. So what we're going to show you now very briefly is video data from a project funded by the National Research Foundation, it's a funding agency in uh, South Africa. It's a joint project between three different bodies, our university, University of Limpopo, University of Pretoria, which is a white university, very different from Limpopo University, and the Human Sciences Research Council, which is a research body for research into the human, humanities and social sciences. So can we now have the second video, please? Now, they don't understand your question. Can you tell them in your language? Tell them in what I want. Tell them. It's all right. They must understand. No? <laughs> Stand here and tell. Stand here and tell. Tell them.
video it was we were recording as part of a national research uh, what teach how teachers are teaching how learners are learning but the teacher of the school said can you please train us we want to learn new things and we said well one way of doing it is that we teach and we record our teaching so we have two models and so what you saw is Esther as a researcher in entering the class and teaching and then the teachers looked at the video and they offered critical comments now, before this teaching started, the teachers claimed that the learners would not be able to understand the teacher's English. But this video shows the students actually understanding. Pretty complex, natural talk. And so this came as a very big surprise to the teachers. For us, we, we did predict that the learners would understand. You also notice that the teacher asked the learner to explain in the mother tongue the teacher's instruction and the learner very, you know, happily uh, translated and the other learner understood. So Esther and myself don't really know the local language but we manage a class by getting, using the students as resources, their languages. Now it's very important that we don't want to deprive the learners access to English. So when one of the teachers said, well, it's fine with you, you don't know the local language, but what about me, I'm bilingual. He said, well, then you have a policy, which you explain to your students, that you don't code switch, you'll stick to English. And if you're forced to, get your learners to translate or cope with it. Um, this, I think, supports Adrian Holiday's point that, uh, you know, we don't, the teacher doesn't have to do everything. But it's a touchy issue in South Africa where the government is pushing for English only in English classes. Teachers are terrified and they don't want to switch into the mother tongue. But if learners switch to the mother tongue to comprehend, to help in comprehension of English, that is not a denial or not a deprivation of access to English. So comprehension of English, production in the mother tongue is evidence of comprehension, is quite acceptable. Uh, these ideas have been very much you know, been based and influenced by Prabhu, who showed that comprehensible input, it was Krashen's idea too, is a necessary condition for language acquisition. If the learners produce in their mother tongue, that is not a negative thing. So, um, yes, this is an example of in South Africa how teachers are being encouraged to actually use their mother tongue in an English class, but for the right reasons. So we do have to have a careful policy of how the mother tongue must be used in the English class. It's not a, we did have years ago a debate with Agni Hotri on this. Agni Hotri comes from the social linguistic camp and says, outside the classroom people freely code switch. So why, why don't we also let learners freely code switch within the classroom? And we say, no, we don't agree with it. What happens outside the classroom, that's one thing. But the classroom is the only place where students can get you know, exposure to English. So the rules for code switching in the English class have to be worked out in terms of, I think, psycholinguistic principles. It's not a free for all. Um, yes. <laughs> One of the issues that um, arises for our students and students in the kinds of schools we've been talking about is that they have very little 
literacy materials in the home and in their communities. And we know that for them to have access to knowledge, literacy is absolutely crucial in their mother tongue as well as in a second or additional language. So we want to talk about another project also in Cape Town where the community has got involved in a literacy initiative and teachers, parents, language specialists are meeting every Saturday and running these reading clubs. They use materials in two or more languages and they've taken charge of the literacy development of the children in the community. So they are exhibiting agency, which is very important. We cannot leave a matter of teaching and learning just to teachers. So can we just have the last video clip, please? It's Saturday morning. The children are coming to the Bullin Lela Reading Club in Langa. We started at 10, but by 10 past 9, a group of them are already there. They love the Reading Club. The Bullin Lela Reading Club is a community literacy initiative of Zisu Kanyo Youth Empowerment, supported by Prisa. We started the Reading Club because we realized that learning doesn't begin at school. So how do we stimulate reading and writing habits? When people around you read and write often and include you in these activities, you start to join in. It's catching. You get into the habit of reading and writing. If you don't have these conditions at home, they can be created elsewhere. We've got such a high rate of children failing grade 12 because they can't read. The more our children get involved in reading, I think the more it will help them because everything now depends on reading. Even if you go to the shop, you have to read. You have to read wherever you go. Even if you drive, you have to read. A community reading club can create the conditions that motivate and inspire children to want to read and write. As they arrive, the children are brought together in play, song and dance. Children get the feeling that the adults here are interested in them and willing to spend their time and energy doing things together. Children, they love to sing, they love to play. And you can learn through playing, you can learn through singing. <laughs> and then we have our Vulin Lela song. That's the hit of the day. <laughs> it was based on Brenda Fassi's Vulin Lela song. And because Brenda Fassi is a Langa icon, you know, children love her, so they know the song, so they use the tune to to come up with a new song which uh, they sing at the Wooden When you see Bully Leila, it's open the way, it's, and then I feel like, okay, I've got something really good to do here today. These children are here, we're going to do something great. That's how I feel about the song. And I suppose the children too, they, they feel that way. Now boys and girls, we're gonna go into our groups, ne? Volunteers divide the children into groups according to their age. Okay, I think we can Let's stop that yeah? happen, They must sit quietly and stop. listen to a story. Once upon a time, can you please stop? Far away. Okay. Thank you very much. We wanted to leave you with some very positive images of what is 
what can be done. Um, I think Professor Kumara Vadivelu said that we have to begin with a desire to do something. And then when something is desirable, it also becomes doable. And here we have shown you, we hope, some examples of what is doable. Uh, on the screen you see a picture of some of our students at the 10th anniversary of the BSM's degree, which was held last year. Uh, we didn't think we would see the day, given the hostility to the program as a whole, to the bilingual degree, but we've completed 10 years and the degree is in good hands. It's moved over to African language teachers who are fluent bilinguals in English and Sepedi. Uh, we want to show you this picture of our students appearing on the cover of Nancy Hornberger's book, which was published in 2010. And these students are displaying children's books which they have translated from English to Sepedi. So a part of the aim of the bilingual degree is also to create resources in the marginalized indigenous languages. And finally, we'd like to leave you with this thought of Tova Skutnab Kangas. She said monolingualism is curable, and we say monolingualism in ELT is curable. Riale Boga, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to open up the floor to questions, please. I'll take two or three in a row. Uh, we'll start with Sir there. Can I please ask you to be as brief and as direct as possible with your questions, as we have a very short amount of time? Yeah, definitely, I will be very brief and direct. Thank you. My question to you, sir, is uh, the script which was there for Sepiti language was, I think, Roman. So does it help when you are bilingual and the script is same? Because in India we have different scripts for our languages. So is it a point to be noted or to be, is it a worthy point at all? Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, the lady over here? Yeah, I just wanted to say one, I keep getting asked by people in India, I have a classroom where I don't know the local language, what do I do? And I'd simply like to say, Thank you for showing that it is possible. I believe in it, but everybody tells me, no, no, you don't know what is happening. We have six languages in our class, and you, what you've shown with two is there with, possible with many others. Your SEMS program may not work in our country. We've got too many languages, but what Esther showed the students, Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions, please. Could I have one more question? Well, very obviously it helps to have a, a language in which the script is the same as English, the Roman script. And uh, we are deeply aware that in India, with so many different orthographies, it is a, a real issue that doesn't arise with the African languages in South Africa. So it is a huge advantage to have a shared orthography. Uh, I'd like to think that uh, the students translating has a tremendous potential uh, as a way of language learning. Uh, translation is a great heuristic device. Perhaps that's not as fully explored in your project, because as uh, a translator once said, it's not when you are critiquing, uh, when you are reading a text that you understand it best, nor even when you are critiquing it, but it's only when you are translating it that you have to get under the skin of the text, and that is the greatest comprehension. So coming from that point of view, the potential of translation perhaps needs greater exploration. I think I would completely agree with you on that, that uh, translation, you, you know that there was a translation, grammar translation of course it was, method, that was promoted for very many years uh, in the ELT profession. But if we leave out the grammar part, the best way of comprehending a text is to translate it, 
because you have to get not only to the words that are on the page but also what is between the lines what was the the intention the subtext um our students do a lot of translation what we showed you was a very very small snippet of how translation can be used by learners as a resource for epistemic access in a project classroom <laughs> In my school, the students are not able to uh, learn uh, English, and uh, they are also discarding uh, Hindi. So they are lagging behind in both the languages. But here, the situation is very far different. Uh, rather, it's uh, far better that uh, they are uh, learning both the languages at one time. So I think this situation is better than uh, our situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And one last question, right in front of me here. I would just like to know how much of English do children bring to the class? Actually, I understand Rob, Rob, perhaps you have English in the background. When they come to the first class, how much of English have you taken any statistics on it? Number one, number two. Regarding your reading club, how is the response? Do parents pay anything or children participate in that way? How does it work? Please speak a little bit about it. Speak a question. Yeah, I hear your question. I am Shobha from Bihar. I am an English teacher. My question is that uh, how can uh, we help the students to speak in English? How can we motivate them to speak in English? If we leave them to, to, them, to talk in mother tongue, if uh, uh, there is liberty of leaving the students to use their mother tongue, then how can they be practicing uh, the second language or the English? Uh, just to answer the first question, comparisons between South Africa and India, uh, I think we have to be a bit careful. We would love to see data of classroom interactions from India and do comparisons based on that data before we jump to conclusions. Uh, there's not, there's too much of policy and very little data on what is happening in classrooms. And so we like to encourage actually. Uh, getting more data of classrooms and then I think it will be very enlightening to see uh, what are the differences. So that would be my answer to the first person there. In looking at emergent writing and emergent reading uh, and it's usually bilingual. So there's a lot of data produced by Neville and Carol Block published in Nancy Hornberger's very famous book called The Continua of Education. So there has been work done, but not by us on that. We are concentrating only on, I think, grade one and grade three, but one would need to look earlier than grade one. So, but that's a useful thing to, uh, to be doing. Uh, the last question about production in English, we actively discourage reproduction in English because reproduction in English choruses do not show evidence of meaning. They, they just play the academic game that <laughs> learners chorus things without understanding. Our emphasis is much more on comprehension of English and there we believe with Prabhu that production will come after a certain period of comprehension almost spontaneously by that. Learners love to produce. We don't have to force them. But when they produce English, let it be communicative and not chorusing and reproduction. So we'd rather delay and not put pressure on learners to produce in English, but rather the emphasis should be on receptive skills like reading and listening and evidence that they have understood. Uh, pardon? Yes. Yes. Uh, the Reading Club has come out with the second uh, DVD and it's being taken to communities, to parents and it's been very inspiring. It's being used for advocacy uh, and the message is really get children to love reading. Don't even worry about the, the technicalities. Like, you know, the phonics method now has come in in a very big way but we should make sure that phonics method doesn't replace the actual exposure to books and reading, and reading big books in a, you know, in a circle. Uh, so all that is happening, I'm sure that is not new to you in India. It must be happening here. 
but we need to see more data, more video recordings, etc. On translation, I can't resist uh, saying to Vanamada that a lot of translation happens in the form of students have to write an assignment in Sepedi, they go to the internet, they find an article, remember one student found something on crash and took down notes in English, translated that and put it into the assignment. So there's a lot of translation that happens when the focus is on epistemic access, that is you're accessing for knowledge. Um, so we have to research the different forms in which translation is happening and not necessarily the kind of, you know, the very formal varieties of translation. Uh, we have actually under-researched our seminar degree. We're so busy teaching, you know how it is. You can't be teaching and also researching what you're doing. So there's a, a long way for us to go. But I'll end here. So, so, excuse me. Can I, can, I, can I ask a question, please? With a I've been waiting for some time. Quick, 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 quick. Yes, with a number of native speakers residing in uh, Africa, South Africa, are, the, uh, are these children totally strangers to English? Are these, sorry? Are these South African children <coughs> totally strangers to English? Uh, no, that's, sorry, that's a good question. In South Africa, English is a second language in the way it is in India. But in certain rural, rural parts of Africa, it is a foreign language. Because the distinction between second language and foreign language, I think, if a second language, there should be some exposure to English in the environment. The foreign language is where there is no exposure at all from the community. So there are parts of Africa where English is, is really foreign, but officially English is considered to be a second language. Students are exposed to media events, etc., but not very much to oral language. Uh, it's difficult to know, to do a comparison between South Africa and India on that. But there isn't adequate exposure to oral language, so many of our students come to university with very low BIX level in English. Uh, one you, last question, if you uh, No, me, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop there. <laughs> okay, thanks so much for your questions. They are available if you do want to take it outside afterwards. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you.